Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today and it will be available in our archives later for you to watch at your convenience. Both our live show and our recordings are free and open uh, to watch to, to anyone. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in the show. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, similar to your state library. So we provide services to all types of libraries in the state, so you may find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, museums, archives, corrections, anything and everything. Really our only criteria is that it's something to do with any type of library. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services, products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on the show sometimes to do presentations about services or programs or things we're doing here through the commission. But we also bring on guest speakers, and that's what we have today. Uh, back again with us, Noah, uh, Noah Lenster. He's been on the show before. Um, he um, is back. Good morning, Noah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And he's going to talk about some great ways. And he has this great website and, and that he um, runs here, this Let's Move in Libraries, which if you're interested in anything, um, great ideas, cool ideas, uh, interesting uh, things that libraries are doing just to get people interested and involved and moving. Uh, so I highly recommend checking that out. But today he's going to specifically talk about uh, teaming up with your community. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Noah, to take it away and tell us all about it. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Krista. And thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, uh, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to, to share with you. And uh, please, uh, yeah, feel free to put uh, questions and comments into the chat uh, or into the questions um, box at any point. Um, and thanks, Krista, for monitoring that. Uh, I'm hoping we can have this be um, as interactive as possible. Um, and just uh, as Krista mentioned, uh, so um, is developing in the course of developing this Let's Move in Libraries project, uh, I really realized um, that in almost all cases, when public libraries were successful in terms of promoting um, health, um, they were doing through doing so through community partnerships. So it wasn't public librarians necessarily becoming fitness instructors or nutritionists or anything like that. Um, it was more public librarians finding ways to successfully work with community partners uh, to increase access to these forms of learning. Um, and I just want to start with an example of how that recently took place uh, from Nebraska. So in Lexington, Nebraska, there were over 200 people in attendance at the Lexington Public Libraries. First, community potluck and street dance on Friday, August 12th. Um, uh, community members were asked to provide a disc to share at the potluck where tacos were provided by El Cezanne Takizas. Um, the music entertainment uh, for the dance was provided at no cost to the library by DJ Lopez. Um, in addition to dancing, children were able to jump around in two bounce houses provided again at no cost to the library by Angel Vasquez Diversiones um, and Chavez uh, Saavedra. Um, and funds for the event were provided by the Lexington Community Foundation. So this is uh, an amazing example of, of librarians teaming up with their community. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's difficult to talk about this top topic is that it is so idiosyncratically local. Um, Lexington did this uh, super great uh, community potluck and street dance. Um, I'm sure uh, you're going to do something totally different with your community. Um, and so what we're really talking about today is not so much the outcome of the relationship relationships, but how do you form the relationships? How could you and your community form the relationships um, that would enable you uh, to similarly uh, tap into the uh, extraordinary power of community partnerships? Um, and we know that this is a challenge, uh, uh, and I'd love to hear what your challenges are, but I, I happen to see on Twitter uh, recently uh, this librarian um, 
said the main thrust of their role at the library is working on developing community partnerships. Um, and all I've really come to learn is everyone wants to take advantage of the library's good will, but runs for the hills when we ask for literally anything. Um, so clearly, <laughs> clearly a problem. Uh, this may be this may be you. Uh, it may not be you. Um, uh, but just to, just to kind of um, kick things off, I'd love to hear. And again, Krista will be monitoring the questions. Um, who, what or who are your library's go-to partners? Uh, the ones that you work the most with or the best with? Um, I'd really love to hear um, who who you find uh, to be your best partners. Um, and alternatively, what are your biggest frustrations uh, as it relates to community partnership work? What what's stopping you from tapping in uh, to the power of community partnerships at your library and in your community? Um, I'd love to love to hear your thoughts. And again, Krista will be monitoring. So Krista, feel free to to jump in if if people share. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in a, but um, yeah, I'll just yeah, type into the questions section. Anybody who has any comments or anything about that, um, any groups, any organizations. Uh, you're mentioning the the first one in Lexington was Lexington Community Foundation, which is a specific foundation for their city. But it reminded me of we have here in Nebraska, which some libraries may mention, <clears throat> is the Nebraska Community Foundation, mm -hmm. which is a statewide organization mm -hmm. that will work with communities to create their local foundations. They will, um, they can help run that, you know, if, if community is having trouble running their own um, charitable giving type place, they can do that for our cities. Mm -hmm. So for something statewide too might be an idea to see if there's something that is available in your community, either city or your county or something too. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Leave leave no stone unturned. Um, and, and I'll just say kind of uh, just to follow up on that, um, uh, I, I see partnerships as more than a request for funding. So <laughs> it's oh, great yeah. if you can give people to give you money, but uh, what, where, the, where the rubber hits the road is, is true, authentic working relationships uh, in which there's a context mm -hmm. of trust um, and, <laughs> and people feel like they're not going to get taken advantage of, uh, like, like the librarian that I shared. Um, and I think there is that, that kind of lingering fear that if, if we get involved too much in this type of partnership work, uh, we're going to be the ones left holding the bag um and we need to get past that <laughs> we need to learn how to how to do things differently so we don't we don't get stuck in in that situation which which happens all all too often um mm -hmm. and so yeah just uh is that you uh what what comes to mind when you think of teaming up with your community um what uh what what words or, or images come to mind um and and just with uh, the format of this i'm gonna i'm gonna keep going but but krista please please do mm -hmm. uh, chime in and interrupt me at any point as you did yeah, you, it's, it's you pretty... have some answers to your first Great. question there yeah, yeah about working with their community um one person mentions their housing authority mm. Um, community after school programs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. School, uh, in the United Way, mm -hmm. I mentioned. Um, and then let's see, here's got a longer comment here. Uh, what I ran into when I was working in a small library, <clears throat> excuse me, was a lot of fatigue on the mm. part of potential partners. Mm -hmm. The same businesses get asked over and over again to partner or donate or help out, and they start to lose interest when they don't see returns on their time, money, and energy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If, Yes, too much, yeah. That that is a really good point, and and I think that uh, and so again, uh, I mean, and I see this especially in rural and small towns. Uh, you you kind of have the same that what I call the usual suspects. Uh, the usual suspects are always on the the planning meetings. They're always the same people, and and so so there it's kind of uh, cultivating um, uh, perhaps uh, new new people, new finding new energy. Um, uh, people people that are not kind of the the usual suspects. Um, um, uh, yeah, I think that's a good point, though. Um, librarians can have fatigue. We can get tired and feel like it's not worth our energy. Uh, the same can be true of our partners. Our, our partners can have that fatigue uh, in the same way that we do. Um, and, and I think one way to address that is to have honest, open conversations about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, let, let 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 your partners know. Like, yeah, I know we're asking a lot of you, um, but uh, we we also get to ask to do a lot, and let's figure out how we can work together so that we're not uh, putting ourselves in the situation where we're tiring each other out all the time. And maybe it's that we need to bring new blood <laughs> into mm -hmm. our coalition. Um, uh, yeah, how can how can you kind of address the fatigue collaboratively rather than each institution kind of um, be isolated and fatigued? Um, would be one way I would. I would encourage thinking about that. Um, 
And, and just, to, just to kind of uh, really put a, a, a head on that, uh, I think this is, uh, partners sometimes feel this way. I think librarians also feel this way. Um, as we're kind of looking at a hypothetical program, um, librarians will often ask themselves, do I have the space for this? Do I have the budget for this? Uh, do I have the staffing for this? Can I do this? Um, and, and I think a better way to approach these questions is to rather than imagine um, by default that we're going to be doing things by ourselves um, to instead uh, from the get go um, ask uh, who could I work with? Uh, is there a DJ in my town? Um, <laughs> could I just ask people to just bring food potluck style? Like who could I work with um, to really uh, do something without uh, fatiguing my staff um, and, and the partners that I, I I work with again and again, because um, even in the smallest town, there, there's people out there um, who could potentially be turned to uh, for for help and assistance. Um, and and I just want to so just uh, this is part of a research project funded by the IMLS. Um, and just uh, just to give a sense of where where uh, my insights are coming from. Um, uh, during the last uh, couple of years, um, I have interviewed um, both librarians uh, as well as library partners in 18 communities uh, to really understand how, how librarians are working collaboratively with others in their communities um, on community-based healthy eating and active living initiatives. Um, and what I've really learned um, is that uh, the same ways that librarians work with partners around healthy eating and active living, it's exactly the same way they can work with partners around spaces, workforce development, digital inclusion, educational equity. It doesn't really matter what the outcome is. Uh, I, I really believe fundamentally there's a, there's a grammar to community partnership work um, that we should be learning and talking about and troubleshooting and figuring out how to do how to do better. Um, and I think that's, that there's a real need there. And we're <laughs> obviously not going to cover all of this uh, in, in a, in a one-hour webinar. But um, my hope is that this will kind of stimulate some conversation. Um, you can maybe go back to your shop uh, and talk with your colleagues, talk with your friends, talk with your board um, about how you could potentially be doing your work uh, fundamentally differently um, with work not done unilaterally by library staff working in isolation, but instead with library staff working collaboratively with, um, with communities. Um, and, and I think this is one of the, the fundamental bridges that we need to cross uh, is to, to fundamentally change the perception of librarians uh, as community partners. Um, because what I found again and again in talking with people from United Way, out of school time educators, parks and recreation, local health departments, et cetera, et cetera, is that uh, by default, um, these individuals do not think of librarians as partners. Um, someone could prove me wrong. <laughs> Um, I, I have not seen the data. Everything that I have seen, all the research I've done, all the research I've seen others do, fundamentally suggests that uh, it's on us to change people's perceptions if, if we want to if we want them to work collaboratively with us. Um, uh, if people are not already working with librarians, uh, they do not understand that librarians are partners. Um, they they may see the library as merely a book repository. Um, they may, uh, if you're lucky, see the library as a trusted resource, uh, but a path of resource, um, a space that's always there, um, a space that uh, people turn to that's stable and trusted. Uh, and based on that, they may see the library as, again, a path of vehicle um, for food distribution, uh, access to social work, access to social services, programs, meetings. Um, they typically, uh, and, and only um, after a lot of uh, relationship building, uh, start to see librarians as partners, um, as individuals that they can work collaboratively with uh, to figure out what to do. Um, and this, uh, and I'd love to hear if this has been your perception, um, if you have uh, a different experience in your community, but this is really what I found, um, is that we have a lot of work to do to change the perceptions of librarians and to really uh, change uh, the idea of what librarians do and how librarians uh, serve their communities. Um, um, and again, my, my goal, my dream is for more partners to get to stage three faster and to really see librarians as partners uh, that they should be working with uh, from, from, from ground zero, as it were, to, um, to really uh, develop things. So it's not just about librarians going out and fostering these partnerships, but um, uh, all partners in every community are spontaneously reaching out to librarians uh, because they know librarians um, have the keys to the castle, as it were, in terms of tapping into um, how communities work and, and operate. 
And, and uh, I'll just put a question here. Uh, as you see here, I'd love to hear any thoughts people have in the chat or question. How have you gotten the word out that your library is a key community partner? What, what modalities have you used uh, to communicate that uh, to potential partners uh, in schools, United Way, uh, et cetera? What, what have you found uh, to be successful in terms of changing the narrative of how uh, librarians work? Um, and this is just uh, as, as you're thinking and putting things uh, in the questions, these are just some of the, the, the ingredients that I've seen can breed success uh, in terms of doing that. Um, uh, one is that uh, especially in larger, larger, more urban libraries, um, there's a culture in which library staff, uh, including paraprofessionals, are seen as the experts. Um, even if someone is a library paraprofessional, a part-time staff member, they, they often have uh, extraordinary um, funds of knowledge uh, as it relates to the community. So seeing library staff themselves as the experts um, in terms of understanding the community, um, uh, there's a culture in which library staff are encouraged to dream and to take risks. Uh, so community potluck and dance party, <laughs> what, a, what a novel idea. Um, but uh, there's a culture in which that risk taking is kind of just uh, part of the day-to-day -day work uh, of the library. Um, and so rather than getting all, all frozen up uh, when, when people, I, I mean, what often happens is that people get terrified of liability. People get terrified that someone's going to sue the library. Get over it. <laughs> get <laughs> over that. Um, that is not uh, conducive to the type of work that's not conducive to teaming up with your community if, if you're operating from this place of fear. Um, uh, success uh, has uh, the ingredient of a culture in which library staff have access to professional development uh, and to resources. Um, so the staff are not kind of locked uh, all the time um, at kind of pu a public desk, uh, but are given the resources and, and time um, to develop relationships uh, and then mobilize relationships. Um, and finally, uh, uh, the, the, this is a, a culture in which uh, anything is on the table. There's not some kind of uh, short list of what librarians can and can work on. Anything that a community is interested in is, is, is a topic that a librarian can be working on. It doesn't matter if it's health, digital inclusion, economic development, entrepreneurship. Um, uh, we we have our our hands on on everything, and therefore we can be working collaboratively with with others on on whatever whatever communities want to work on. So this is kind of what success uh, looks like uh, in practice. Um, and I'd love to hear kind of uh, just thinking of these these four ingredients. Uh, do you feel like you have these four ingredients at, at your library? Um, where where are you successful? Where where do you have weaknesses? Um, uh, yeah, and where do you see opportunities to grow? We do have some comments from people, um, ideas for how they reach out to their community partners that have come in. Um, and there's a couple of different people mentioned the same thing. It's um, meeting with them one on one, mm -hmm. uh, listening to their needs, mm -hmm. uh, the partners, and offering how the library can help. And, and this is something that's mentioned by multiple people attending their meetings, attending mm -hmm. their, if they have open meetings or monthly meetings, uh, the board meetings of their um, organizations, or if they have an event that they're hosting go to it mm -hmm. yeah sure that the library is is interested in what they do as well in, for their events and programs not just asking you to you know help them out with the libraries you know it's a back and forth yeah um, no, and I think those are great, and and I I love the focus on on the one on one and meeting people where they are, and and I'll just share kind of uh, one of my in my research one of my favorite uh, kind of examples of that is um one librarian uh, in Massachusetts um she told me that one way that she develops uh, these relationships is she quote unquote forgets to take her name tag off at the end of the day, <laughs> so she'll be walking around the grocery store or whatever like with her name tag on, and and it's kind of then she's visible is kind of the, the librarian and it can be kind of a conversation starter. Um, it's like, oh, I didn't, I don't know, like I've never met you before. I've never been in the library in 20 years, um, but it's kind of, um, yeah, just, just looking for those kind of low, like easy ways to kind of be, be approachable, invisible um, in the community uh, as a librarian, uh, which then kind of opens the doors to conversation about what that means. Um, 
the one thing that I will say, um, and I think there's a lot of focus on on listening, um, and, and <laughs> I think listening is important. It, it's fundamental. But so is talking, um, and we don't we don't talk enough about how to talk about your library. And again, I think so much of the problems that we face um, come down to the fact that we don't know how to communicate our, about our own needs. Uh, and we have needs. We have needs as individuals. We have needs as institutions. Um, so listen, yes, uh, but talk too, um, because uh, I think so often problems arise uh, when we spend all of our time trying to listen and meet people where they are, but don't don't reflect on, okay, but what, what do I need? <laughs> what do I need to sustain myself and my institution while I'm also trying to work collaboratively? So to have that back and forth, there also has to be that cognizance of the fact that we have needs um, and, and that has to be part of the conversation. Um, and and I, I, I think it can also help as you're going out uh, to really convey to people that uh, that libraries can be a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, and this is a, a video that I will often use. Uh, I won't uh, don't have time to have you watch it now, but if you have five minutes at some point, um, I would encourage everyone to take five minutes and watch this video. Um, it's an amazing story about how this this librarian in California, uh, she teamed up with her community to meet a, a very uh, easy need. So there was California hot. It's a hot place. Southern California gets a lot of sun. Um, and there was kind of this uh, nonprofit community fitness group that was looking for a space outdoors to exercise um, out of the sun. Um, and and that, as they kind of looked around the community, uh, they, they eventually found their way to the library. Um, and, and they asked the librarian, hey, you have a covered parking lot. Uh, would it be possible for you to let us have part of your parking lot for, for our, our fitness class? Um, and Norma Arvizu, the librarian's like, yes, of course, you're taxpayers. You are our community. We want this space to be for you. Um, so rather than worry about, oh, someone's going to do the library <laughs> or any of the risk and fear that so often people get, it's like, yes, of course, come in, use the library. That's what it's here for. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing example of someone who has uh, the foresight um, to really uh, listen to communities um, and then respond by by opening the library to what the communities need uh, in that instance. Um, um, and so just to, just to, I want to tie this to and uh, something that's uh, many probably on the on the forefront of many people's minds. Um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, everyone and their brother um, has been trying to start story walk initiatives uh, during during the pandemic as, as librarians mm -hmm. turn their attention to outdoor spaces. Um, but I, I think there's a, there's an opportunity here. What what is a story walk like? What fundamentally is a story walk? Um, is it it's a, on the one hand it's a it's a physical installation. It's a, it's a pages of a typically a children's storybook posted along a walking trail. Uh, so that's one way to think of a story walk. It's a convenient way to keep providing programming during a pandemic. Um, but I found in my research that a story walk is also a catalyst to community partnerships. Um, because especially if you're trying to do story walks for the long term, you need to be developing relationships to work collaboratively with others to figure out who's going to maintain this installation. We can't be going out uh, mowing grass and <laughs> and kind of uh, weatherizing uh, this. Uh, we need our partners to help us. Um, it can't just be about librarians uh, doing this work all by ourselves. Um, and, and, and this is not a, not a new phenomenon. As I've been researching the history of the story walk movement, um, I found uh, this uh, uh, show me librarian from Missouri um, uh, back in 2014 talking about uh, there are many reasons why I love the story walk pro project uh, we now have a partnership with our county parks department um, the picture book walk has truly been a joint effort with the library and the parks uh, sharing ideas and tasks um, as a result we now have a working partnership we know how to work together to get things done um, the potential in this new relationship is vast and this is what we need to be doing. We need to we need to shift our thinking from uh, programs. What are the programs and services that we want to provide? Uh, to instead, what are the relationships that we want to cultivate and leverage? Um, and and in this case, uh, the relationship was with uh, a county parks department. Um, but we have such potential to be out there, kind of cultivating uh, and leveraging relationships um, to transform our community um, and also to transform how how librarians are seen and perceived. Um,
which at the end of the day is going to be uh, the good community goodwill that you need um, if you're trying to get a bond referendum going or a new building or any new initiative that's going to require taxpayers to come out in support of the library in some way. Um, and so again, it's about shifting our thinking from uh, what services can we provide um, to uh, what relationships can we have uh, with, with our community um, and what do we want those relationships to look like. Um, and I'm just going to skip over this, um, uh, but but again, it's just a lot happens in libraries. The other thing I think it's, uh, and I can't say this enough, um, is that I think sometimes um, we fall into the trap of imagining that we can only touch uh, certain things. We can only be about books or literacy, um, but lots happens in libraries, health, economic development, digital inclusion, lifelong learning. That's extraordinarily vast uh, in and of itself, uh, cultural heritage, um, and just really open, open, open Pandora's box as it were and, and start from the premise that anything can happen uh, with, with the right partners in place. Um, and that's just a reality I think we need to wake up to um, if, <laughs> if we haven't yet accepted that. Um, and, and so again, it's also about shifting from being all things to all people, which I hear all the time. People are like, I have so much on my plate. How could I possibly do anything more? Um, and, and I hear that. And, and I think that the answer is stop doing everything. <laughs> stop doing all things for all people. Stop imagining uh, that you have to do it all by yourself. Um, and instead, uh, start thinking about um, how how you can uh, get together with with others to to do new things, whether it's a story walk, a community potluck and dance party. The particular initiative, in some ways, uh, doesn't really matter. It's more about the, the fundamentally how do you how do you get out there and, and form those relationships. Um, and again, uh, like I said, it's also about being articulate about your needs. Um, you have needs. Uh, that's that's reality. So go out there and listen, meet people where they are, but also ask reflect um as, a, as an individual as an institution what do you want from partners um what do you have to offer partners um and then think about how you communicate those things um because yes we need to be getting out we need to be doing outreach but outreach is not the answer community engagement is not the answer partnerships are not synonymous with community engagement um those are both important but but different things um, and so now I want to spend uh, just uh, the, the second half of this webinar um, really just uh, talking about uh, how you can build better partnerships within your community. Um, and this is just uh, one person's take on this. Um, so as we, as we go through this, um, uh, I'd love to hear any, any comments or concerns uh, or questions or, or things that you found successful. Um, so keep, keep putting things uh, in the question box uh, as, as thoughts come to you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I found in, in my thinking that uh, the garden life cycle can be a really powerful way to think about, uh, about partnerships. Um, and one reason why is that I think sometimes people are concerned uh, that if they, if they start working with someone, they're gonna be working with that organization or individual for in perpetuity <laughs> for the end of time. Um, and that's not true. Uh, just as in uh, some gardens, you plant different things in different years. Um, just because you start working with someone doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden married um, <laughs> for the rest of eternity. So we'll, we'll, uh, so some partnerships are perennials. They may come back year after year. Others are annuals. Um, uh, learn to recognize the difference. Learn to uh, recognize who are the organizations and individuals that you can always count on. Um, who are the organizations and individuals that you may be able to count on for this particular thing, but uh, you can't <laughs> necessarily count on them for everything. Um, uh, and also learn to let go, um, but also learn to recognize when, hey, the, the Parks and Recreation Department, they just hired this new director, um, and this person is super gung-ho about working with the community. Let's, we, need to, we need to catch this person's ear <laughs> and make sure they, they know kind of what we're trying to do in the library and, and are, are interested in working with us. Um, but just as in a real garden, there are no guarantees of success. Um, uh, you, you may ha think you have the perfect seeds for your climate, for your local environment, and nothing happens, um, and that's fine. Um, I think failure is, is a part of the process, just as it is uh, in a garden, uh, because every season we're back in the garden, um, and every season we're back uh, in our community kind of uh, beating the streets, as it were, um, to find people we can work with to make a difference in our community. 
Um, and so let's talk a little bit about kind of how do we plant the seeds of community partnerships? How do we nurture those seedlings? Um, and how do you harvest your bounty? Um, and the fourth part is kind of putting your garden to bed. Uh, apologies, I left that off the, off the slide. Um, but starting with the seeds, um, uh, and, and I really think that the fundamental seed of community partnerships uh, is trust and relationships. Um, you and your partners need to know each other, um, and you have to have some sort of trust. There has to be some shared uh, common common language. Um, um, and, and you can start this internally by, by kind of reflecting on what groups or organizations uh, you and your library may already be connected to not via not only staff, um, but your board, your friends, uh, even volunteers. Um, uh, you, may, you may find that you have a lot of uh, kind of seeds out there that you can, you can cultivate. Um, Another great way to kind of plant the seed uh, is to really find uh, those kind of uh, umbrella organizations. So someone mentioned United Way. Um, I think United Way is kind of the, the perfect example of an organization that has uh, its tentacles into a lot of different areas. Um, so uh, these kind of catch-all organizations, United Way is one, Rotary is another, Chamber of Commerce. Um, there could be a health coalition or food council in your community. Um, I mean, they'll be different from place to place, uh, even a community foundation, but just um, who are the organizations uh, that exist in part to bring people together? Um, that's, where you, that's where you need to be going to kind of uh, be planting the seed uh, and building the trust, uh, building up the idea that the library wants to be seen uh, as a community partner. Um, and, and I think also as we're doing this work, and, and I, I, I can't emphasize this enough, um, it, to do it sustainably, um, you also have to be taking care of your own needs. Um, and so it's not about kind of just uh, putting yourself second um, and the community first. Um, it's about uh, really reflecting and building up for yourself uh, your own rationale for doing this work. Uh, so why, why are you a library worker? Why do you continue to get up and, and go to work in libraries? Um, and, and really uh, use that, that kind of uh, uh, almost um, internal uh, purpose to, to kind of keep you motivated um, and to keep you kind of um, uh, beating the bushes, as it were, when, when people ask you repeatedly, how does that, how does it feel to be uh, sitting around reading books all day or, or all the other nonsense that we know uh, people are going to start saying um, when, we, when we start communicating about uh, the vast potential of, of librarians as community partners. Um, so build up your armor, um, build up your, your strength uh, to go out and be like, actually, <laughs> That's not that's not how any of this works. Um, and uh, and and but uh, yeah, let's let's talk about how how we can actually work together to make a difference. Um, and confidence is a key ingredient in the process of building relationships. Yes, we need to listen. Yes, we need to people be meet people where they are. But if we are not confident fundamentally, we are not going to go very far. Um, uh, if you're only listening and kind of absorbing what people say, um, you're going to get burnt out. Um, you're going to feel like you're being taken advantage of. Um, and part of that is on you. Part of that is uh, because you haven't been articulate about your needs and you, you haven't built up the confidence. Um, so be confident, be bold, be brave, um, and, and be aware of, of all that you and your library have to offer the community um, if only the community would work with you to, to do new things. Um, um, and so just, uh, we don't have time to do this. Um, if I were doing this in person, I'd have people break into small groups um, and just, just do a little uh, kind of, uh, what's your networking introduction? So, um, and this can be a great thing to do at, uh, if you have staff development days or uh, committee meetings, um, just have people go around the room and say like, how do you describe uh, to a potential partner what it is that public librarians do? Um, and <laughs> yeah, so, and just uh, the alternative, uh, another way to think about it, that is how do you respond when someone says, uh, gee, it must be great to sit around and read books all day. Um, and so <laughs> I think this is, is really critical. So again, we don't have time to do this, but I would love to hear if someone has um, something they want to share. Uh, and as a question, what do you use? Uh, what, what's the language that you use to communicate uh, the idea of the librarian as a community partner? Um, what, what have you found to be successful? Um, I'd really, really love to hear if, if people would be willing to share. Yeah, we hear that too much of what they assume we do as in libraries and what actually happens. And it's 
I mean, uh, for years and years, have been trying to explain it, and I, it still is disheartening. We have so many surprised faces. You say, well, mm -hmm. actually, libraries do, and yeah. you listen, like all of the things and all of the, mm -hmm. everything we're involved in, and how it actually works in a library. Um, is it, so, if anybody has any like uh, cool tips or tricks or how you've been able to get that point across, please share. <laughs> we need more ideas about how to get that word out. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely, and and I'll just say it's it it is kind of um um it's it's in a way unfortunately um I mean I think the reality is that it is kind of a never ending process um even if you uh, establish that uh, I mean the staff of your or partnering organizations may change you may have a go to partner in parks and recreation who retires um and then they bring on a new staff member and so it's you have to be actively doing this on an ongoing basis um you have to be planting the seeds permanently just like in a garden you can't kind of plant seeds once and expect to get watermelons for the rest of your life um <laughs> you have to be you have to be out there doing it um on, yeah, on a regular great. basis yeah. great That's, and somebody say earlier yeah that was a great analogy about that yes um and so someone here does say um i tell people my job is to take the library to the people out mm. into the community um and when people say it must be nice to read all day i just say i wish <laughs> <laughs> yeah the other things i yeah. do that i don't have time to read <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, and I like that idea of taking taking the library to the community. I think that's that's really great. So good, yeah, that, great. Um, and so just just to kind of keep thing, moving moving things along. So we've talked about planting the seed, uh, but what do you do with those seeds? So you have trust, you have relationships. Um, what do you do uh, with with that trust and those relationships? How do you how do you kind of um, yeah kind of help help those seedlings kind of come out of the ground and and start to uh, produce something um, valuable for the community? Um, and 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 again again so I, and I think uh, someone kind of hit hit the nail on the head earlier when they talked about uh, active listening, um, basic small small mm -hmm. talk. Um, um, but but again, also telling the potential partner uh, about you, uh, being articulate about your goals. What's what's the vision you have um, for for your community and for your library in the community? Um, and then uh, that's kind of first date. But uh, when we're talking about nurturing the seedlings, we're really talking about that second date. So you you've built up that basic trust. Um, you have uh, a modicum of shared understanding. Um, and then be be bold. Pitch an idea like uh, I saw this library in Lexington or, or Omaha or <laughs> anywhere um, uh, I saw this that li this library did uh, did something um, yeah I mean do you think we could do that um, and and I'll give you an example of how this works uh, and again I, I think a story um, can sometimes go a lot way um, so this this process literally happened uh, in, a, in a community called Seabrook, Texas. Um, and so I interviewed the librarian who, who did this. So to, to, to kind of uh, take, to take a step back, um, in Seabrook, Texas, the librarian there, she saw other libraries starting community gardens. And she thought, we have this green space in our library. We have this lawn space. Um, wouldn't it be great, rather than just have grass uh, that nobody uses, to, to utilize this space to start growing food um, and teach people about how to grow food? Um, and and she knew she knew there was literally no way that she and her staff could do this by themselves. Uh, so that's a non-starter. Um, so rather than um, kind of say, okay, we don't have the staff time to do this, we're going to let this idea um, go by the wayside. Um, she very smartly um, said, okay, every time I go out in the community um, and talk about the library, I'm going to also tell people we have this great space and would love to start a community garden. Um, and she did that. She went to the Rotary, talked about the library. She went to the school, talked about the library and tell people to sign up for your library cards. Um, and she'd kind of weave into that. Oh, and by the way, we would love to start a community garden. <laughs> um, and so she did that for, for a couple months. Um, and at one of these meetings, uh, the city manager was in attendance. Um, and then a couple weeks later, um, uh, a completely different uh, organization came to the city manager and said, um, hey, city manager, you know what Seabrook, Texas needs? Uh, we need a community garden. Um, and the city manager is like, oh, have you talked to your librarian? And they're like, what? 
<laughs> no, of course not. Why? Who? Who in their? Who? Who on the planet um, who thinks about starting a community garden would talk to a librarian? I mean, the own, but but the, but because the librarian was out there, kind of hitting hitting the pavement, uh, talking up uh, this idea, they were pitching their idea. Um, uh, the city manager knew to connect the librarian to this organization. Uh, they started meeting monthly. Um, they organized a whole plan. They started small. They started with an herb garden that's a lot more manageable. Uh, that expanded to um, a vegetable garden, and most recently, they've started having uh, a fruit uh, fruit forest. So, so native trees that don't wow. work well in Seabrook. Um, and it all it all started by by building relationships and pitching ideas. Um, and 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 I think that's important. Uh, the the idea pitch is so important. It's not about librarians uh, saying we're going to do X, Y, or Z. It's about pitching something, saying we could do this, but we need you. <laughs> we would love to do this, uh, but we need you. Um, and being being a little bit um, even stickler about that, being being upfront about what your needs and capacity is. Um, don't overcommit yourself. Don't uh, don't promise people you're going to do more than you can, but do be do be pitching things um do be out there saying like hey we'd love to we'd love to work on this let's let's figure out how to work together um and but to, to get that to get to that place you need to have a strong foundation uh so so in seabrook texas uh, the library uh and this nonprofit, um they didn't immediately start uh, picking up shovels uh, and building a garden um they met uh, many times they met monthly for over a year before they actually started planting a garden um and they worked together to figure out who else they could bring into their coalition who else do we need oh we probably should check with public works um oh we may want to consult with parks and recreation um, uh, but they kind of built up that foundation um, to, to figure out how they could strategically fill in gaps um, and also figure out uh, hey do we actually um, as partners have the capacity to go and do this um, they took the time to build that foundation um, um, and yeah, there's there's a lot of ways. So sometimes it's like, uh, do you want to put a ring on it? So um, <laughs> is in a small town, uh, a handshake may be enough uh, for that that trust. Um, you may want to, for a larger uh, interinstitutional partnership, you may want to consider a memorandum of understanding, um, uh, possibly even a contract or or a formal proposal. So so and again, this this is kind of. Uh, I, I want to say you have options uh, when you're nurturing your seedlings. Um, you have options that you can pursue um, if you feel like you really trust uh, this person or organization. A handshake may suffice. Um, in other cases, you may actually want to have some sort of written agreement, uh, which can be really helpful, especially if there's staff turnover. What if what if you lose your your go-to partner in parks and recreation? Um, it can be super super helpful to have written agreements uh, in place, especially if you're talking about larger initiatives um and and i think it's key to just recognize that there's there's different options uh in different different scenarios um, um i think so it goes the same way for the library too we have sometimes you have lots of turnover in library staff mm -hmm. yes um, we had yeah. library director yeah. come in who reach out to us here at the nebraska library commission for okay what do i do as a director can you help mm -hmm. me what, what are we involved in and sometimes there's not a lot of paperwork or communication from the previous um, director or if there's been um, conflict between a director and library boards and the city and so nobody passed on the information having something yeah. in writing that they can go and find yes. and and to, to know that yes this was a project that was happening and here's exactly what was done and what needs to be done yeah. um, very important you don't want to like get yeah. left like also holding the bag where you know you did a handshake with some some business and then they backed out on you too yeah. i mean that's yeah that's and, to... and and that's actually krista that's that's kind of exactly what we want to talk about in harvesting your bounty um because part of harvesting your bounty is exactly that that documentation um how and and I, and I think uh, sometimes documentation doesn't get done because it's seen as just some bureaucratic black hole. <laughs> uh, but but I actually think documentation can be done in a different way. You could you could approach documentation as a way to celebrate your successes. Uh, we want to keep track of the partners we work with um, because that's good for our bottom line. Um, and so so really seeing documentation not as kind of um, just something you have to do like eating your fruits and vegetables as we sometimes get told to do but instead thinking about it like, oh, it's <laughs> awesome. I get to eat this broccoli and because I, I learned to love broccoli. So uh, yeah, thinking thinking 
thinking of it as not just some bureaucratic process, but something that you want to do because you want to celebrate your successes um, and mm -hmm. you want to document that work so that you can tell that story, which again is extraordinarily useful both for building future partnerships, um, mm -hmm. but also for sustaining them. Um, and, yeah, and that documentation could also be successes and putting out those press releases or just yeah. announcements saying hey we yeah. did this thing with this group mm -hmm. then other groups may other part potential partners may see that and say oh really we can yes. do that the library like that this that what you're talking earlier they said why would we even contact the library well mm -hmm. if the news had been spread that you'd been doing things yeah yeah absolutely yeah it helps to build buzz um and and then also i think it can also really be helpful for for funding um a lot of funders uh, a lot of community foundations a lot of uh kind of organizations that want to give communities money they don't necessarily want to give money to a library at least not a library working by itself um what they really want to give money to um, is community coalitions. Um, they want to give money to uh, efforts that have the buy-in of a diverse array of community partners. Um, and and by by kind of harvesting your bounty, uh, celebrating your successes, and documenting what it looks like, um, you are setting yourself up for lots of funding opportunities that you probably didn't know you had access to. Um, and I've seen that uh, again and again. Um, your your partners they also have access to funding streams that you do not um and and by working with them you can tap into the funding sources that they may they may have access to um and so there's just uh, so many ways that you can you can harvest your bounty and but taking the time to do it um and then the, the fourth oh yeah go ahead talking about the nebraska community foundation i was talking about they many of their um some of those foundations do actually have on their applications they want to know who are you who is your who are your partners they want to know not just this is just this one entity trying to do this thing but is there community support and who is that community support they want to make sure that it's you know, going to be sustainable and if you have those partners that will help you get those grants and get that funding that you need yes, yeah absolutely and then then just the last uh, last step and and then we'll we'll have time for kind of just q and a and discussion is to at the end of the day you you've kind of planted some seeds you've nurtured those seedlings uh, perhaps into specific programmatic initiatives um you've harvested your bounty um and and really celebrated uh, what's come out of your garden uh, by by documenting it and <laughs> and and sharing it um and then uh at the end of the year to, you you kind of reflect um you take the time um to say like like, wow, that partnership was great. I can't wait to do that again. Or alternatively, like that partner was awful to work with. Uh, they expected us to do everything. We are never going to work with that organization again. Although never say never because uh, <laughs> they, yeah. yeah, they may have some new staff uh, a couple years from now. But but yeah, just um, be aware that um, not every partnership that you work with is going to be uh, an annual or a, a perennial. Um, there may be instances where uh, you decide that for the time being, we're not going to work with parks and recreation in our town because for whatever reason, they're just a dysfunctional organization um, and they're they're kind of bringing our dysfunction into uh, bringing their dysfunction into our organization. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, just just being aware that you have options, taking that time to reflect. Um, yeah, what worked, uh, what didn't work, um, what are we going to do different next time around? Um, I think that's a really important part of the process. Um, um, and yeah, I'd I'd love to hear. I I, I think uh, I when I when I gave a version of this uh, at the Association for Rural and Small Libraries conference uh, last October, I asked this question: Have you ever had to let go of a partnership, um, or have you ever had a partnership that really did not work <laughs> the way you thought it was? Um, and and it was amazing because like everyone had stories to share, and it was clear to me that uh, people are not. Uh, finding opportunities to talk about these challenges. Um, so I think as a way to kind of uh, wrap things up, uh, I'd love to hear like, um, yeah, have you had struggles? Um, uh, what, wh where where have you had instances where, where things have gone off the rails for one way or the other? Um, and what have you learned from that process? Um, I think that's something that we don't, well, haven't in the historically talked about enough, but it's becoming more of a thing. And there's been over the last, you know, I know, 10, 15 years in at, uh, I've seen at conferences, learning from failure. It's mm -hmm. okay. You don't have to have everything be a success. Mm -hmm. Learn, you know, what you did wrong, what the partner did wrong, and you can just re, you know, um, reset and try something new, um, mm -hmm. a different way of doing it. And that's okay. It's mm -hmm. okay to not 
have things work out. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, if anybody has had any partnership that didn't work out too well, um, let us know. Uh, we do have a comment from earlier when you're talking about doing the um, for the PR for what mm -hmm. you're doing and sharing it that says make it a win-win for both groups and it helps both sides, not just mm -hmm. the one but that partner yes. too can benefit from the mm -hmm. library sharing and saying hey we did this great thing the library did it and this was our partner it makes that partner looks good too that's mm -hmm. the selling point to them i think that you know they get good pr out of the um helping this wonderful you know community um service the library yeah yeah and and i i think when you when you're thinking about kind of that win-win and kind of um yeah pr I know sometimes uh, it can be really helpful to think uh, very strategically and deliberately about this. Uh, so, so I talked with a library in Maine, um, kind of small town Maine, um, and uh, and for them it was strategically, politically extremely important that they have a good working relationship with their local school district. Um, but the school district is hard to work with. Um, they're very insular, they're very bureaucratic uh, in this town. Um, and so the librarian said, it's fine with me um, if I'm doing uh, the lion's share of the work, because um, uh, we're getting, at the end of the day, we're getting the publicity of being associated with the school district. Uh, we're, we're saying, oh, the school district is working with the library. Um, and even if I'm doing most of the work, uh, I still see this as a valuable partnership to keep working at, because in my small town, um, it's politically uh, extremely important that it be seen that the library is working with the school. Um, and just having those those candid conversations, like there may be some partners that politically or strategically, even if you're doing most of the work, um, it's still worth doing because of what you get out of it. Um, but just, yeah, what what are the wins? So, um, and, and how does your partner benefit? How do you benefit? Um, and it doesn't always have to be 50-50. Yeah. <clears throat> But uh, but yeah, this is um, and just um, uh, I'd love to just to kind of wrap things up. Um, what have you heard that is new to you? Um, uh, uh, what do, what do you need to better understand this topic um, and take what I've said uh, and shared and put it into practice? Um, and fundamentally, how can how can we or how can I do this presentation better? Because I'm always <laughs> learning as well. So I'd love uh, any any feedback. Um, and if you feel like you'd prefer to put it in an email, um, you can email me just my last name, Lenstra at uncg.edu. Um, uh, and I wanted to share, uh, so I've been, uh, I'm not just kind of <laughs> uh, talking with librarians. Uh, as I do this work, uh, I'm also trying to really talk, talk with partners. So how can we shake up uh, common partners to get them to see librarians different? Um, and so as part of that, uh, I'm actually speaking uh, at the Kansas Department of Health, uh, the statewide uh, public health department in Kansas, um, uh, working with a, a faculty member at a Emporia University, as well as a librarian uh, in Southeast Kansas um, to do a webinar on closing the gap, um, really focused on what, what do people working in the health sector need to know um, in order to work better with, with librarians. Um, and so to kind of do this, it's not enough to just talk with librarians and tell them to do things differently. We also need to be be having uh, an analogous messages put out there with people in the health, uh, education, uh, technology. Um, it's really about, uh, and so if people are interested, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to join us uh, September 8th. Um, um, and uh, I think we're about at time. So yeah, any any other uh, final thoughts or questions people have? Uh, and like I said, if you have any feedback, I, I would love, love any any feedback, the, the good, the bad, the negative about <laughs> how things went. Uh, I, I, it really means a lot to me and I, I take it very seriously. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I was actually looking, I was just noticing on that um, that you're doing in Kansas, uh, Janet Reynolds, she was a presenter at one of our Big Talk from Small Libraries online conferences. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, back, I was just looking it up your 2020, and she spoke about fitness, food, and fun with seniors, senior yes. citizens, that is. <laughs> yeah. 
No, I love Janet. Janet's really, she, she's the best. And, and she's really like, uh, I see Janet as kind of uh, like um, an amazing model of kind of this this collaborative librarianship um, because literally everything that she does um, has has some sort of community partners roped into it. So it's like, I mean, she's she's got, <laughs> and she leaves no stone unturned. She's like, okay, we want to have some, some exercise classes for kids uh, during our summer reading. I can't do this, um, but I know the retired PE teacher, let me go see if I can get the retired PE teacher to do Fitness Thursdays for me for the kids coming to summer reading. Um, and she's just like so, so good at kind of um, building those relationships that allow her library to be a center for, for learning and so many different modalities. See, that's something that's interesting. That, that, that's, that's awesome. Just I know I know a guy basically mm -hmm. is that, yeah. that that's a partnership. I know a yes. guy who can do this kind of thing. Let's just ask. It doesn't have to be like a official, an official organization or a business. It just could be, I know somebody. <laughs> yeah, very, very organic. I mean, that's why I love the garden life cycle is that I think it, it works best when it is organic. Um, and you have some kind of uh, safeguards in place to kind of document um, how things went. But at the end of the day, it's an extraordinarily organic process. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, we do have a couple of comments. Someone says, thank you so much, Noah. Great program. Uh, and then someone says, this has been uh, wonderfully thoughtful. I wonder if any of these steps could be transitioned into templates, almost mm -hmm. a workbook of sorts to help libraries proceed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Thank you. So, and that makes me think about, I'm wondering, you said this, some of what you're doing is part of an IMLS grant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, what is um, what is going? Is that grant still come, you know, being worked on? Is there more to come out of that? Yeah, um, yeah, or, yeah. And 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 thank you, thank you for whoever uh, answer, answered that. We do have a project website. It's kind of uh, part of the broader Let's Move in Libraries. Um, mm -hmm. uh, probably the best way is just to subscribe to our monthly newsletters to get get key updates. Um, and if you email me, I'll add you. But we are planning, um, and <laughs> so we're in our in our last year now. So we are hoping to put together some sort of uh, handbook or playbook, um, playing around with the vocabulary, but something that would take some of this content and put it into kind of a more action-oriented format that people could peruse um, either physically or online. Um, so I really appreciate that feedback um, and <laughs> stay tuned for more because um, it's definitely something I, I want to I wanna work towards creating. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you. Nice. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. Absolutely. And honestly, I am signed up to the newsletter, so I do get all the um, announcements. It's it's not overwhelming, like you said, monthly, you know, just an update of what's going on in um, the Let's Move and Want library. So it's good to get ideas, too, for uh, what other libraries are doing. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I know we're, we're about at time, so I went a little bit over. So I want to thank everyone okay. for We for started your time a little today. after 10 o'clock, yeah. so that's not a problem. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, so, all right. So thank you. Um, I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen here. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Noah. This is great. I'm so glad we were able to have you on the show again. As I said, you've been on before. Um, and we highly recommend is the, the Let's Move in Libraries uh, page. And I will link to that on um, here on the, well, actually, is that what the, this go to? Let's go to your page. Okay. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we got some more thank yous coming in on, on the chat as well. Thank you so much for this great information. Uh, so uh, I think, yeah, we'll wrap it up for today. Uh, the show has been recorded and will be available on our website. Um, I'm also going to show you here, I'm just going to jump over here quickly when you're talking about Janet Reynolds, um, our big talk from Small Libraries online conference that we do annually. It's always the last Friday in February. Uh, I'll be, um, and I just looked up here to see that, yeah, Janet, if you want to watch a recording of her session, uh, Fitness, Food, and Fun with Seniors, and then actually she was in previously too in 2018, you were talking about the summer um, reading program, More Than Summer Lunches, Social, Cultural, and Healthy Connections. So she did a couple of things on, um, a couple of sessions on uh, Big Talk from Small Libraries, if you want to check that out and um, watch her recordings or any of the other recordings coming up from that. Um, and uh, we'll be in my sometime next month plan is to open up the call for speakers for Big Talk from Small Libraries 2023. Uh, so if you're interested in that, it will be the last Friday in February is Friday, uh, February 24th, 2023. So soon this website will be updated for our next one. But whoops. 
So we'll wrap up for today. Um, our archives, um, I'll show you here. Uh, this is our main Encompass Live page. Our upcoming shows are listed here. Our archives are right after that, so you can look in here. Today's show will be at the top of the list. Should be processed and ready by the end of the day tomorrow. Everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know that it's ready. And then you can go here. I'll have a link to the recording and a link to the slides um, that uh, Noah will send to me at some point. I don't, you know, I don't think you sent it yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll send, I'll send those. Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, so that'll be available for everybody here. Um, you can also search our show archives. I mentioned we have so many shows and lots of different to topics. You can search for anything in here. Um, you can search the whole show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want just something current. Um, that is because this is our full archives. I'm not gonna scroll all the way down because as you can see, this is really huge. Um, this um, is our show shows going back to when Encompass Live premiered, which was January 2009. So we've, we're going on um, over 10 years, 12 years worth of uh, show archives here. And we'll keep them up here as long as we have a place to ho host them. Uh, you know, we're librarians, so what we do keep things for archival and historical purposes sometimes. Um, so just pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything if you do watch in our, our recording. Uh, things may change, resources and services may be completely different. Uh, some links or things may no longer exist too. Uh, so um, just keep an eye on that when you, you, know, you know, some things do stand the test of time and are still good, useful, accurate, you know, useful information, but some things will become old and outdated. So just look at that date. We also have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you'd like to use this, use Facebook, give us a like over there. We have a reminder, this is a reminder for today's show, information about our speaker, when our recordings are available, we post on here as well. So if you like to use Facebook, you can do that. Also, we post on Twitter and Instagram. We have the hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation for our show, um, if you like to keep up with us there. So that'll be it for today. I hope you join us for next week's show when it is a Pretty Sweet Tech Day. The last Wednesday of every month is Pretty Sweet Tech when Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, comes on the show to talk about something techie related. Uh, so we do tech shows other times in the month, but you can always count on her to be here at the end of the month. And next week, she's gonna be talking about WordPress layout walkthroughs um, from the blank page. Uh, so she's got a lot of questions about how do I customize my WordPress so it just doesn't look like everybody else's. So she's going to take us through some, um, and there has been an update recently, I know, um, to WordPress. So this will be helpful to a lot of you maybe have been struggling with figuring out what do I do now. Um, so please do sign up for that show and any of our other upcoming shows. We've got September dates getting filled in here. Uh, note, October 5th, we always take the week off for our Nebraska uh, Library Association annual conference. This year it's October 5th and 6th so we will not have an Encompass Live on that week. So other than that thank you everyone for being here today thank you for joining us again Noah glad to see you um, I'm sure we'll have you on again sometime <laughs> uh, maybe when you wrap up this uh, project you can come back and report to us on how it all went. <laughs> yeah thank you I'd love to and thanks thanks everyone and I just sent you the slide so have yep. a good day. Yep I see the email right there awesome all right Bye. we are go. all right so thank you everybody uh, see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye.